Let's pray together. I'm going to ask you to put your right hand in your heart. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to speak to my life, that you administer to my heart. I pray that your word would be revealed to me today in a way that I can understand it, so that I can speak it, so I can do it, and see it change my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to ask if we can just reset the clock. Amen. The, that started early with the sermon. Let's just. So today we're talking about the battle rages. Tell your neighbor the battle rages. And I want you to think about the greatest day of your life. The greatest day of your life is the day that you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you come to know him as your Lord and Savior. There is no better day than that. It's a day when you passed from an eternity without the Lord, an eternity in death, an eternity that the book of Revelation talks about as being the lake of fire, into an eternity of life, an eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no better day for that than anyone because He comes into your heart and He forgives you of all your sin. And so on that day, the change is so big that literally your eternal destiny has changed. You've passed from an eternal destiny of darkness to light. And you find new ways and you find new purpose. All of a sudden, you have something to live for. I want you to understand that before you know, the Jesus, uh, before you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you actually have nothing to live for. But that's the good news. Because something else also happens on that day. And on that day, what happens is we've changed sides. So up until that day, maybe you supported Liverpool or Manchester City. And then, and then you give your life to Jesus and now you're supporting Manchester United. I want you to realize if you listen to the cheers and the jeers and all of those sorts of things. There's no middle ground here. You're either a United or a City. You're either a pool or you're United. I see an Arsenal in the, in the crowd as well. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying? Mr. Jacques is an Arsenal there. All right, you can't be an Arsenal and a Manchester United. And I want you really to think about that very carefully. Because when we think about that in the sports arena, if you swap teams, you've changed sides. And the day you give your life to Jesus, it's like you've changed sport teams. You've changed sides. And um, you've changed sides in the spiritual world. Our hearts become a battlefield from that moment on between good and evil, between right and wrong, and between righteousness and unrighteousness. In fact, the battle that's going on in our hearts from that moment on is actually the battle between God and Satan. And whether you like it or not, the second you give your life to Jesus, you are in the battle. It's not an option. It's like if you're going to watch football, you're in the battle. Either your team's winning or your team's losing. You can't support Kaiser Chiefs and Orlando Pirates. You can't support Orlando Pirates and Mamelodi Sundowns. You can't support Mamelodi Sundowns and Amazulu. You're in one of those teams and if you change teams, you change teams. The supporters that once cheered you will now stab you. Amen. I mean, one of the players playing for Manchester United the other night, he came on the field and he used to play for Chelsea. You should have heard the boos around the stadium. The same stadium that used to cheer him now booed him. And I want to tell you the same demons and the same uh, Satan that used to cheer you now cheer you. And it's not an option. The battle has begun and you have to choose whose side you're on. As the prophet Elijah said many, many years ago, choose this day whom you will serve. And if it is the Lord, then serve the Lord. Tell your neighbor, if it is the Lord, then serve the Lord. Here's the other thing you need to understand. If you, used, if you support City, you don't have to choose. You're not united. Amen. And the thing is, before you chose Jesus, you don't have to choose. You belong to Satan. You literally belong to the devil. Literally, you're his. 
There's no argument. There's no discussion. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 and 26, it says, In humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God will perhaps grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth. And, so, and listen to what he says. So that they may come to their senses and escape the snare, which means the trap of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. If you do not know Jesus, you have been taken captive by the devil, you are doing the will of the devil. Ephesians 2 verse 2 says, uh, talking about you're now children of the light, he says, uh, compared to what you were like before, he says, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And a few weeks ago, we looked at that word works means energizes in the Greek. You were being energized by Satan. You were being energized by the devil. And, and, and now you're no longer being energized by him. 1 John 5 verse 15 says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world belongs to the devil. And when you give your life to Jesus, you no longer belong to the devil. So, here's the thing. Before you give your life to Jesus, there is no battle. Because before you give your life to Jesus, you belong to the enemy. You're his. He doesn't have to fight for you. He doesn't have to look out for you. You belong to him. You're his possession. Amen. It's like I don't have to fight for my wife. Maybe I must fight with her, but I don't have to fight for her. Because she's mine. The battle happened before we got married. Now she's mine. Now, unfortunately, before you give your life to Jesus, you, it's like you're married to the devil. You need to understand how serious this is. The whole world is under the sway, which means it's under the control of the wicked one. And so I cannot understand when people have a half-hearted commitment to Jesus. I cannot, I've never been able to understand that. It's something that has never made sense to me. Because there's one thing that I've realized. The world has nothing to offer. You know, I can remember at a time, when I was still a lot younger, amen, and my wife still thought I was good looking. <laughs> my wife used to come, we used to both work in the same building. I used to work on the fourth floor, you were on the sixth. Two floors above me, hey? You organize your chicks right there, you know what I'm saying? And anyway, often I'd be working late on a Friday. And then what would happen was she would come and she'd sit by my desk. And normally my manager would walk past and say, ah, oh, you're sitting here waiting for him again. Ha, 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 ha. But then as, as I'm working and, and I was under pressure to finish some stuff, there was the pub area for the department, not far away, maybe 40 meters away. And so what would happen at about 4 o'clock, the guys would start arriving at the pub. And then you hear normal conversation. But by 5, half past 5, my word, it's loud. And the oaks are laughing. And they're laughing at things that aren't funny. They're laughing at dad jokes. <laughs> and they sound stupid. You know, if you're there getting drunk with them, you think you're so clever. No, you sound like an idiot. You're so intelligent. And an hour or two later, you are a total fool. You've got an IQ of three. <laughs> Amen. So when 80 is a low IQ, your IQ drops to three. Amen. I want you to understand the world has nothing to offer. So you might as well put it all into Jesus. And I see many people today that are living in two worlds. They want um, enough of Christianity to get them to heaven. But they, they still want to live like hell. And here's the reality. The worst way to live is to be someone who's given your life to Jesus and then to be living in sin. Because you know where you should be. And you know that there's more to life than this. And yet somehow you don't click. Wait a second. I need to choose whom I'm going to serve. I need to make a choice. And, 
Elijah was telling the Israelites in 1 Kings 18 verse 21, he said, Elijah came to all the people and said to them, how long will you falter between two opinions? That's the issue. You're faltering between two opinions. The Lord is God. Say the Lord is God. <coughs> follow him. But if, if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Elijah standing there in front of them and he's challenging them. If you're going to follow the Lord, follow the Lord. If you're going to follow Paul, then listen, do a good job of it and follow Paul. Go sacrifice your children and do all the things that the Baal followers do. But if you're going to follow the Lord, stop messing around between two opinions. Stop messing around between two worldviews. And follow the Lord. Joshua said in Joshua 24 verse 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. Choose for yourself. Now for some people it seems evil to serve the Lord. Look at me. How many of you say I've been to church this week. I don't need to go again. It's evil to go to church twice. Hey I've been to church twice this week. God forbid you tell me to go three times. God forbid I go to church and to pray mental. Should I say, God forbid? Because it's for the woman, you know. <laughs> Amen. God forbid I go to church and to prayer mental. Oh, and then I must go to life class as well. Oh, no. no not, not me. It's evil to tell me that. Amen. But he says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers whether the gods your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Notice he said, are you going to serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell? In other words, because they served the Lord, they've now taken over. So you want to go serve the gods of the nation you beat. You want to go serve the gods whose lives suck compared to yours. You want to go serve the opinions of a world which can't even keep a marriage together. A world that doesn't even know what a woman is. Amen. We live in a world that cannot define what a woman is. And then we say that the people 2,000 years ago were, 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 were primitive. We say the women, the, the people 200 years ago were primitive. Oh, look at those people in past generations. They had slavery. But we can't even define what a woman is. But now you want to serve their gods. Moses and the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy 30. He says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give them. So you need to choose. If you're going to be a Christian, you need to be a sold out one. You need to be one that is sold out to the Lord. Jesus said in Revelation 3 verse 16. So then, <coughs> because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now some pastors like to put it this way. They say, I want you to be red hot for Jesus. But if you're not going to be red hot, I'd rather you were lukewarm. But if you're not going to be lukewarm, hey, cold, you being cold is my Lowest option. Jesus doesn't say that. He says either I want you to be red hot or I want you to be stone cold. But if you're lukewarm, you're like vomit in my mouth because you're going around telling everyone you're a Christian. But when they look at you, they see Satan. And so you give Christianity a bad name. That's what Jesus is saying. Because understand, when people know you as a Christian, they judging Jesus by what they see in you. They judging the Lord by what they see in you. And so what this is saying and what Jesus is saying here in the book of Revelation, that rather be hot 
or cold, but lukewarm is better than cold, is worse than cold. It's better to be cold than to lukewarm. It's better to be cold than to have a half-hearted commitment to the Lord. Jesus says that's not acceptable. He says, I want you to be in his kingdom. Or he wants you to be out there with the devil. And he says, I want you to decide. You can't have me on this foot and Satan on this foot. You can't have us both. Luke eleven twenty three. Jesus says this, and I want you to listen. Tell your neighbor you need to listen now. He says, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. If you're not gathering with Jesus, you're scattering. If you're not gathering with Jesus, if you're not totally for Jesus, then you are against Jesus. And if you're against Jesus, you got some big issues. And so therefore, from the moment that you give your life to Jesus, the battle is raging. Why? Why is the battle raging? Because the devil has plotted over thousands of years against God and against his creation, which is people. The devil has been plotting against you for thousands of years. And he wants to distort in your mind what God is. He wants to destroy your idea of God. And one would have thought that Satan was successful by crucifying Jesus. But what he did not realize, that he was orchestrating his own defeat. Because when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the devil gave Jesus legal access to the keys of death. That gave Jesus the legal right to overcome death. And that is why the devil is raging. He's raging mad because he's given up his authority. He's given up his dominion. And death couldn't hold Jesus down. And so thus the devil's opposed to Jesus. And he will oppose any follower of Jesus. If you're sitting here today and you're a believer in Jesus, the devil is fighting you. The battle is raging. And the thing you hear, even when you listen to people talking in politics, you know, I'm watching a lot of American politics. And what does everyone say? You know, we must just all be united. America must be united. It's the greatest country on earth. If America can be united, then America will be heaven. I want to tell you, listen to me very carefully. You cannot be united. If you are pro-life against abortion, you cannot be united with someone that is fighting for abortion. Now, I want to tell you, Maybe there's one or two people here that have had abortions. Jesus can save you. But at the end of the day, either abortion is murder or it's not. Either you care about human lives, either murder is an issue for you or it's not. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. And, and what I want you to realize, even when I say something like that, that causes a tremendous challenge because of all the stuff that you've heard. But too often we're not talking about the real stuff. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground between God and Satan. It's a fight. It's a battle. And you have to make a choice. Are you going to win? Or are you going to lose? Because if you choose to go with the devil, you're choosing to lose. And Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not worried about people that belong to other political parties. In Ephesians 6 verse 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I want you to understand that there's a battle that's raging. And it's raging for your soul. And the only time it's raging for your soul is when you've answered the call of Jesus and said, I want to submit my life to Jesus. I want to say Jesus is Lord. Now here's the other warning Jesus gives in the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> he says that when you hear the gospel, it's like a seed that is being sown. So every time you hear the gospel, a seed is being sown into your life. And when the seed is sown, he says about... The one type of seed which landed on the pathway. And when it landed on the pathway, 
Birds came and took that seed before they had the opportunity to germinate. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 and 19, about that seed that landed on the pathway, Jesus said this. He said, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes and snatches it away, what was sown in his heart. This is who receives the seed by the wayside. I want to tell you, it's not only for the unbeliever. Tonight you're hearing this word and it's deeply convicting. And the devil wants to snatch this word away from you immediately. He wants you not to remember this word. Because right now as I'm preaching, the Holy Spirit is talking to you, but the devil is opposing and he's here to attack you. He's here to oppose you. He's here to fight everything. He's here to try and to stop the work of God in the life of the believer. But I want you to understand as the devil is there fighting you, that just as, just as the devil is fighting you, there's a God who loves you. But just as there's a God who loves you, there's a devil that hates your guts. He hates you with every fiber in his being. And he is like a roaring lion that is seeking to destroy you according to 1 Peter 5 verse 8 and 9. The devil is aiming to destroy you. But those who are steadfast in their faith will overcome the devil. And as Christians, we are not called to live a life of ease. I want all of you to look at me. I want everyone to hear what I'm telling you today. Too many times, people are hearing the message, come to church and life's going to become easy. Sometimes, the message in some countries is come to church, give your life to Jesus and they might kill you for your faith. But the message is, the gospel is so good the good news is so good that even if they decide to kill you, you are going into eternity with the Lord. And it's better to lose your body than to lose your soul in hell. Amen. So there's a war. There's a struggle. The battle is raging. Tell your neighbor the battle is raging. Christianity is not a playground but a battleground. And many Christians want to live on easy street. They want to just sit back and count their blessings. They want to go into the parking lot and lay their hands on a Porsche and say, I claim you in the name of Jesus. But I want to tell you, guess what? Guess what? A Porsche is a nice car. And if you've got a Porsche, if anyone here has got a Porsche, awesome. Even better if you've got a Lamborghini. Amen. But it's better to have a footwag on your feet than a Lamborghini. It's better to have a footwagen with Jesus than a Lamborghini with the devil. If you believe that, give the Lord the biggest shout of praise. You. Amen. Amen. If you're a true follower of Jesus, the battle will rage. And our choice is whether we're going to win in the end or lose. Whether we're going to advance or retreat. Most people are looking for a nice, comfortable little foxhole so that they can dive in it and just sit this one out as the bombs are going. Most Christians are saying, I just don't want any trouble. You know, I just want peace. You can't have peace with the world. Okay? The Bible says to have peace with the world is to be an enemy of God. It doesn't work that way. Either you're going to advance and you're going to be used by God or you're going to retreat. And it's time to get out of the foxholes. It's time to dust off your clothes. It's time to put polish on your armor. It's time to sharpen your swords and to get on with it because like it or not, you have been drafted into the army of the ever-living God. Amen. You are in the army of God. Whether you like it or not, and you are called to be a soldier in that army. And your choice is whether you're going to be a good soldier or a bad soldier. So you must make that choice. Who's the most dangerous person to be in the world, in a, in a war? The most dangerous person to be in a, war, in a war is a soldier who's not fighting. A soldier who's in, universe, who's in uniform and has put their gun down. That is the most dangerous person to be in a war. And I want you to understand that God is looking for men and women that are ready to go into battle to make a difference. And so it's time to toughen up. You can't be a spiritual wimp. Tell your neighbor, you can't be a spiritual wimp. And now we've got Pastor Shane's famous verse from 2 Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4. You therefore, tell your neighbor, you therefore. Come on, point at your neighbor, say, you therefore. Must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ.
No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Your number one aim is to impress the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore you need to toughen up. Tell your neighbor you need to toughen up. Most of us don't want to toughen up. Most of us want to stay supporting Manchester City. Amen. I'm joking about Manchester City. Most of us want to support the world. We want to support the world. We believe in Jesus, but we want to support the world. I'm sick and tired of seeing Christians who put YouTube videos up attacking other pastors, other theologies they don't agree with. Because the moment you do that, you're supporting the world. They haven't read 1 Corinthians 6. Don't air your grievances before the courts of this world. Do you think it's not the courts of this world on YouTube if you go make a video? Don't go into your workplace or your school place and complain about anyone in church. Next thing you're complaining to Muslims or Buddhists or atheists or whoever, you're complaining about the church. That, that, is, not, that is not for you to do. And when you do that, you're a spiritual wimp. And the thing is, Many Christians don't want to toughen up. And in fact, at the first sign of anything difficult, Christians want to bail. Christians want to give up. They want to throw in the towel. They want to say, I didn't sign up for this. This is too hard. This isn't as easy as I thought it would be. And what they don't realize, the devil's bringing a temptation. And they fold under the first temptation. They cower the first time it gets tough. The first time it gets tough in terms of their time. The first time it gets tough because you've got to stand up and you've got to confront something. Someone came to me today telling me about a, a school with six, seven-year-olds that wants to speak to the, the children about gender. And they've announced it in a newsletter to the parents to say we've notified the parents because they know most parents aren't going to read the newsletter. They want to tell your son, it's okay to think you're a boy. I mean, it's okay to think you're a girl. They want to tell your daughter that you cannot answer the question, what is a woman? So you can sit back there with your, pina, your Christian pina coladas. You can sit there, you know, on your, your, your Christian um, blow-up mattress on the pool. You can sit there and relax. But the devil's fighting you. The devil's fighting your children. The devil's fighting your brothers and sisters. The devil's fighting your parents all the time. There's a war going on whether you like it or not. And um, Pastor Bert says, I don't think they were Christians to begin with many times. And that's a challenge for you as, you, as we're sitting here tonight. Have you really accepted Jesus? Because if you really follow the Lord, you're going to be tempted with us. You're going to face opposition. And so you need to recognize that and brace yourself for it. But the battle we're fighting is a spiritual battle. And the weapons we use are not human weapons, but powerful weapons of God's warfare for the destruction of the enemy's strongholds. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6. It says, For we walk not in the flesh. And we do not war according to the flesh. I don't war by taking my fist and knocking your teeth out. I don't war by taking a gun and blowing your brains out. I don't war by going and throwing rocks at someone. We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments of every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into, a, into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I want you to understand the biggest battle you're facing are the strongholds that the devil has placed in your life. And what are the strongholds? They are areas of your thinking where the devil has control. The devil has controlled your life. He's controlled you. 
And the problem is, when you have the strongholds, the strongholds lie to you. And now you're deceived. And the problem with you when you're deceived is you do not know you're deceived. That's the meaning of the word. You think something that's, that is true that isn't true. Or you, th you think something is not true that is true. Maybe you think, for example, you've got a stronghold and you think marriage is not for this age. Maybe you think there's no such thing as true love. These are the kinds of lies that are strongholds that the devil puts in your, in your mind. And the thing is, you have the power of the word. You have the word of God. We have spiritual weapons. We have the blood of Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit to tear down those strongholds. Because every stronghold is a legal argument that the devil has against you. And the Lord has given you the power through his word to tear down those strongholds. Now, I need you to understand something. We are living in a really critical time right now. And in our day and age, and in, in, in this, at this point in history in our nation, the devil is working overtime. He is busy, busy, busy. He's busy seven, seven days a week. He's busy 365 days a year because he knows his days are numbered. He also knows his judgment is sure. And he knows there's nothing that he can do about it. And that he, therefore he's doing everything that he can to cause as much havoc as he can until the day he faces judgment. And that's why we need to get busy. We need to be, get busy because every battle counts. Every battle counts. Every battle counts because every soul counts. Every single soul counts. Every day is important. And Romans chapter 13 verse 11 and 12 says, And do this. Tell your neighbor and do this. This is what Paul's saying. And do this knowing that the time is, sh knowing that the time is short. Knowing that now it is hard time. In the NLT it says, Knowing the critical strategic period of time. All the more important, time is running out. Time is running out. And, and, and that's why it's hard time to wake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. The NLT puts it this way in verse 11 and 12. This is all the more urgent. Tell your neighbor, this is all the more urgent. For you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will, be, will soon be here. So remove the dark de deeds like, filth, like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. What he's saying is cast off those works of darkness. Cast them off. Be done with that. Be done with the compromising life. Be done with trying to live in both worlds. Let's suit up. Let's suit up with the arm of God. Let's get busy. Let's engage. Let's watch what the Lord will do. Amen. I want to ask you. Are you comfortable? Maybe you don't feel like you're facing any battle now. Maybe there's no conflict. What Pastor Bert will say is, maybe you're not worth attacking. Maybe the devil looks at you and says, why bother? This one's no threat to me. They just sit in there on the sidelines. They're preoccupied, pre preoccupied with themselves. They're not reaching anyone for the gospel. They're not bothered about living a godly life. They don't care about making a difference. They just sit around and feel sorry for themselves. So the devil's saying, hey, why must I bother with you? 
I already have you where I want you to be. He's telling his demons, no, 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 don't worry about Pastor Shane. We got Pastor Shane right where we want him. Leave him. Attack Bernice. Because she's winning disciples there left, right and center. She's filling the children's church. She's doing, don't worry about Pastor Shane. Obviously, I'm joking about it. But if I said your name, would I be joking? I wouldn't know, but you do. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm not going to tell you, say, hey, Musa, the devil's not going to waste his time with you. I'm not going to say, I don't know. I don't know. You know the other thing? Many Christians... They will tell you I'm being attacked by the devil. What? Because the police are after me. Why the police ask after you? Were you were you preaching the gospel? Now they claim I stole something at pick and pay. They said they said they found me with a bag of zool. It's not the devil. That's just the consequences of your life. That's just the consequences of the death that the devil's bringing into your life. The devil's not, then doesn't have to worry about you because you're already immobilized. You're already sterile, which means you're not going to reproduce yourself. And you're aware the devil wants you, so he doesn't bother with you. And so you say, I don't have to handle a lot of conflict. If you don't have to handle a lot of conflict for the gospel. And I'm not, I'm not talking about handling conflict because of the stuff you want. I'm talking about handling conflict because of the gospel. That's not a good sign. That's not a good sign. But if you're facing conflict because of the Bible. If you're facing temptation to stop. Good. That's good. Myself and Pastor Bert are glad to hear that. Because it indicates you're moving in the right direction. I'm not here to scare you. By talking about a battle. I'm, I'm not here to, to tell you things so that you can feel overwhelmed. The good news is, is that while the devil is powerful and he's trying to get us the good news is that God is more powerful and the Bible says the battle is the Lord's I said the Bible says the battle is the Lord's 1 John 4 verse 4 says this you of God little children and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world the words of Jesus on the cross it is finished have reverberated around all of eternity. They reverberated, they shattered all the devil's furniture in hell. They shattered the devil's palace in hell. They shattered the homes of all of his demons, all of his minions. All of the powers of hell have had their places of comfort shattered by that moment when Jesus said, it is finished. And so Jesus says the battle is finished. They're attacking you and they might be able to slow you down sometimes. They might be able to make you feel bad sometimes. They might be able to sap your strength a little bit sometimes. But we stand in His strength. We stand in the strength of God. We fight with Him. We fight for Him. With Him working through me, I can take ground for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you say, and I want you to listen to me. When you say, I want my life to make a difference. When you say, I'm ready to fight. Then just watch. Ask Musa. The moment you say that, the fireworks have begun. And Musa is experiencing that right now. Because now the devil starts fighting. And now you say to me, I'm much worse than I was before. No, you're not. You're just engaged in the battle. And you think you're worse. It feels worse because, you see, 
before you were dead. You couldn't feel anything. You just had no feelings, so you didn't know how dead you were. You didn't know there were worms crawling up out of you. But now you're alive. Now there's a fight. Now there's something worth fighting for. But if the fireworks begin, I promise you this. Your life will never be boring. Your life will be exciting as you walk with the Lord. And here's what I want you to listen to me now. Amen. Everyone look up at me. If your life becomes exciting because of the Lord, you don't need to drink. You don't need to take drugs. You don't need to sleep with people you're not married to. You do not need to to, um, wallow in your mental illness. You don't need to wallow in your depression. You don't need to, to sit there and feel bad about all of your financial issues. Because your life's going to be exciting. And many times in many situations, just when you think it's the end of the world, guess what the Lord's going to do? He's going to come through with you. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, that the Lord is going to come and He's going to rescue you and He's going to wipe that enemy out. I don't know why, but I keep getting these stupid videos of lions chomping a zebra. And the one I even saw, there's like a monkey in the tree and the lion's climbing in the tree. But I saw this one video and I, and I try always, I say, I don't want to see these things. Not interested. Not. Then these damn things keep coming up. So I saw one where this lion comes after a troop of wildebeest. And it grabs one. Bam! This little wildebeest goes down. Because they get one of the kids, you know. Like a devil, he comes after your kids. Anyway, next thing, three or four of these big wildebeest turn around. And the next thing they come and they run straight into the side of the lion. Next thing the lion's like a dog that's been kicked in the stomach. And it like runs away. Little wildebeest gets up and now all the big wildebeest. They stand in there and they're watching. And the lion's thinking of coming. And then the wildebeest charges and the lion backs off. It reminds me of the times when Pastor Shane used to go with the old bus with Patrick and other guys. When the girls used to go to the parties. And the parents didn't know that the girls were at the parties. Pastor Shane would walk in there with his big Congolese, Nigerian and white guys. And all the guys would get scared. And the girl would be cross, but she'd be safe. Amen. And it's exactly the same with you. When the devil comes and attacks you, just think God comes in, Jesus comes in, like Pastor Shane and Patrick and all the Nigerian guys. And those demons all sit there and they start getting scared. They thought they had you in slavery and human trafficking. And Jesus says, they belong to me. And the demons say, who them? I didn't even realize they were here. Amen. And I'm going to ask you to stand now. And, and I want you really to think about where you stand. And I want you to close your eyes and I want to ask you, have you chosen this day who you're going to serve? Have you chosen whose side you're on? <clears throat> we talk about the life class. Maybe you're thinking, I... I'm not interested. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you to, to change your mindset. To choose the side of Jesus. <clears throat> the core rings out from the Word of God. Choose who side you're on. Choose who, you, who you're going to serve. Choose if you're going to follow the Lord. If you're going to follow the Lord, then follow the Lord. Because He offers you forgiveness. And if you will come to Him, You will be forgiven. You will experience His mercy. You will experience His love. When you go through challenging times, you will experience His comfort. And as you're thinking about this, you can also reject Him and you can face the consequences. (laughs) 
It's time to say enough of this foolishness. It's a foolish thing to reject Jesus. It's time to say from this night, I'm going to step forward. I'm going to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to join his army. I'm going to be his disciple. I'm going to be the mighty person that Jesus intended me to be. And right now what I want to say to you is that God is speaking to you. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond to him. And so right now, if you're here and you do not know Jesus, maybe you've never seen the necessity for him before. But all of a sudden you realize I'm under the control of the devil. And if I don't do something, then I'm going to be under his control forever. And you don't want to be under his control forever. Then I'm going to invite you right now to come forward. Or maybe you're standing here and you've given your life to Jesus before. And the Lord has been speaking to you. And he's speaking to you very strongly. And he's saying, I want you to choose. I want you to choose. If you choose, you're not going to lose out. If you choose, you're going to be blessed by him. And so I'm going to ask if, if you need to come and either commit your life to Jesus or recommit your life to Jesus, then just pick up your belongings, come out from your seat and just come and stand in front of you right now. I know there are others of us. And I, I want to challenge you now. This is not a time to sit there and just to, or to stand there and just, just to sort of be indifferent about this. I know there's many of you here tonight. This word Jesus has spoken to you. I want you to realize that your eternity is at, at stake here. All over the place, there are people in churches who think they know Jesus. And Jesus warns, listen, I will say I never knew you. And I believe there are people here right now. And Jesus is saying, you're in danger of hearing those words. You need to come forward now. I see someone else coming forward. Can we give him a big round of applause? Amen. I really, I believe there's people that need to come forward. I want you to ask the person next to you if they need to come forward. And I'm going to ask one last time. Some of you are struggling. And you're saying, I'm not ready, I'll do this later. The problem is that, um, no, you won't do it later. You won't make it. Because today is the day of your salvation. And this altar has been set before you right now. The Lord Jesus Christ is here. And this altar sanctifies everything. Don't think that you're going to have a better prayer time later. Because now is the time. Now is the time for you to come forward. When you come forward, you're saying, Lord, now is the time. Lord, I'm tired of this other stuff. Lord, I'm tired of having my feet in two worlds. Lord, I want to commit to you right now. I want to commit to you right now because if I wait, I do not know if I'll make it. You're saying, Lord, I do not want to live in fear anymore. I do not want to be afraid of death. I want to commit to you right now because I do not want to live eternity far from you. I want to know that when my time to die comes, that I'll be fine because Jesus, you'll be there with me. I want to know that death won't affect me. 
And so the Lord Jesus Christ is, I believe he's still calling one or two. I don't know who you are, but I still, I really feel a sense that one or two of us need to come forward. And the thing is, I just want to say this to you as you're standing there. You know, there's two things you need to think about. Can we just give him a big round of applause? I mean, there's two things I want you to think about. None of us know how long we're going to have on this earth. None of us know how long we're still going to be here. The second thing is none of us know when we might fall sick. When we might fall sick and then we're not able to do the things we want to do. I've seen people before who say, you know what? I took the Lord's work for granted and now I can't do it. You never know when you might not be able to do it. And so one last time, if there's anyone else, just come forward. I'm going to ask all of you that have come forward. You can come forward even as we start this prayer. I'm going to ask you all just to put your right hand on your heart. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I want you just to visualize Jesus. Just see him standing in front of you. And right now I want you to remember him dying on the cross for you. And think about how much he loves you that he died on the cross for you. And the Bible says that this Jesus who died for you over 2,000 years ago, he's the same Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary for you, there in the Middle East over 2,000 years ago, that blood is washing your sin away right now. His work stands once and for all. He is paying the debt that your sin has caused you to have before Almighty God. The blood that he shed was the price that he paid. And this is the blood that will wash your sins away. I want you to see this debt you have before God. And it's being paid right now. By the commitment that you're making. I want you to think about whatever you regret. Jesus, by his blood, is forgiving you right now. And he's giving you his Holy Spirit. And so I want you to utter this commitment and repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I recognize that I'm a sinner. I repent of everything I've done wrong. I renounce my life of sin and I accept your sacrifice because I know that it was the price that you paid for my redemption. And tonight, Lord, I ask that the blood of your wounded body would wash me of all my rebellion all my sin that you'd set me free from any sickness and from any pain Lord I accept that my debt has been paid there is no outstanding balance you paid everything for me at the cross of Calvary I accept that by your blood I'm justified and you see me as if I've never sinned and by your blood I'm sanctified for you have chosen to serve me and you have chosen me to serve you. And Lord, I want to serve you because you've served me. And so today, Lord Jesus, I open the door of my heart and I ask you to come in as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me and for giving me eternal life. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we just give them a big round of applause? Come on, let's give a big shout of praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys here just to turn around, just to follow Marcus and Pastor Shane on that side. Um, um, can one of you who's here, Rich, can you guys just 